Enslaved women were routinely raped by their captors. In the 1600s, enslaved women were raped aboard the slave ships destined for North America. However, after 1808, forcing enslaved women to have sex, for the purpose of bearing children, was routinely done for profit. The offspring of these enslaved women would be slaves for life, and their owners could put them to work or sell them. In 1808, the United States Congress prohibited the importation of slaves from Africa and the West Indies. President Thomas Jefferson advocated for the prohibition. However, the 1808 prohibition did not ban domestic slavery. Jefferson was a slave owner from Virginia. Unlike states in the Deep South, Virginia did not need to import slaves. Instead, Virginia had a surplus of slaves due to declining tobacco production and it exported slaves to the Deep South. In fact, Virginia's leading export was its domestically bred slaves. Jefferson knew that banning the importation of slaves would increase the price of domestically bred slaves. During his lifetime, Jefferson owned as many as 600 slaves. In 1820, Jefferson stated the following, I consider a woman who brings a child every two years as more profitable than the best man of the farm, what she produces is an addition to the capital, while his labors disappear in mere consumption. In 1792, in a letter to President George Washington, Jefferson said he was making a 4% profit every year on the birth of black children. Jefferson had six children with a slave named Sally Hemings. States in the Chesapeake Bay region, such as Virginia and Maryland, bred slaves for export to the cotton plantations of the Deep South. In the early 1830s, cotton production was expanding due to the forced removal of Native Americans from their homelands in the Deep South. However, cotton production was still labor-intensive and the South depended on slave labor. This led to the Second Middle Passage, as approximately one million slaves were transported from the Upper South to the Lower South to work on cotton plantations. Cotton was a key component of Britain's Industrial Revolution. Britain depended on cotton grown on southern plantations. British money markets provided capital to southern plantations, which allowed them to purchase land, equipment, supplies, and slaves. Slaves were mortgaged. These mortgages were then bundled into bonds. These slave-backed bonds were then sold to investors around the world, London, New York, Amsterdam, and Paris. The global demand for cotton pushed up the prices of both cotton and slaves. Investors from around the globe could profit from slavery without owning slaves by purchasing these slave-backed bonds. By 1831, the United States was the leading cotton producer in the world and a global economic leader. In his book The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism, Edward Baptist says, it was through slavery and slavery alone that the United States achieved a virtual monopoly on the production of cotton, the key raw material of the Industrial Revolution, and was transformed into a global power rivaled only by England. In the early 1830s, slaves could be purchased in the Chesapeake Bay region for less than $400 and sold in New Orleans for $1,200 or more. Slave traders such as Franklin and Armfield earn huge profits by purchasing slaves in the Chesapeake Bay region, transporting them to New Orleans or Natchez, and then selling them at slave auctions. This created a financial incentive for slave owners in the Chesapeake Bay region to breed and export slaves. These slave breeding operations were known as breeding farms. Ned and Constance Sublette's The American Slave Coast, A History of the Slave Breeding Industry, says enslaved women's bodies served as the engine of the slave breeding industry and powered a global economy for cotton consumption. Breeding farms were primarily occupied by female slaves and young children. A handful of male slaves were kept around to impregnate the female slaves. Harriet Jacobs, in her book Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl 1861 wrote slaveholders actively encouraged their enslaved property to reproduce by cajoling, threatening, and coercing them into intimate relationships. Enslaver then either sold or exploited the children born of these sexual relationships for labor, earning themselves a profit. Female slaves were valued on their ability to reproduce and were referred to as breeders or breeding stock. Some owners preferred women with big breasts and wide hips because they believed they were better breeders. 
Male slaves were valued on their physical attributes and their ability to impregnate female slaves. Male slaves were referred to as bucks or studs. Owners preferred men who were healthy, muscular, and well endowed. Owners typically paired male and female slaves who they believed would produce strong field laborers. The historian, E. Franklin Fraser, in his book The Negro Family, stated that there were masters who, without any regard for the preferences of their slaves, mated their human chattel as they did their stock. A married slave could be paired up with someone other than their spouse. Little regard was given to the possibility of incest. One practice was to place bags over the heads of the male and female slaves as they were having forced intercourse. Neither participant would know who they were having intercourse with, since it could be a relative, such as a parent, sibling, aunt, uncle, or cousin. In some cases, plantations hired male slaves from other plantations to impregnate their female slaves. These males for hire were known as stockmen. A stockman would be placed in a room with several female slaves, and his job was to get as many female slaves pregnant as possible. Slave owners, their sons, and overseers were known to rape their female slaves. Henry Bibb was the author of Narrative of the Life and Adventures of Henry Bibb, an American slave 1849. Henry Bibb wrote, A poor slave's wife can never be true to her husband, contrary to the will of her master. She can neither be pure nor virtuous, contrary to the will of her master. In the South, a child born to a slave mother was a slave for life. Even children who were fathered by white men and appeared to be white were still slaves for life under the law. These children were the property of the slave owner, who could choose to keep them or sell them to another slave owner. Young, light-skinned female slaves could be sold to slave traders, who auctioned them as fancy girls for the explicit purpose of sexual exploitation. In New Orleans, fancy girls sold for four to five times as much as a female field laborer. Fancy girls were destined to become prostitutes and concubines. Female slaves were expected to become pregnant by the age of 13. They were expected to have four or five children by the time they were 20. Between pregnancies, a female slave was usually assigned field work. With no time to care for their babies, the mortality rate for infants born to slave mothers was very high. One in for infants did not survive. As soon as the infant was weaned, the child was generally taken away from the mother and eventually sold to a slave trader or plantation owner. Slave narratives tell us that some enslaved women resisted their owner's wishes to have them bear as many children as possible. Enslaved women knew that their bodies were being exploited for profits, and they did not want to bear children who would live their lives as slaves. The use of available substances that acted as contraceptives or that caused miscarriages was widespread among enslaved women. A common practice was to chew, cotton, root, bark to prevent pregnancy. Or if pregnant, drinking 10 to 12 drops of turpentine would induce a miscarriage.